sort of start off by talking about sort of how incredible it is how much has changed in the Hudson Valley as a place where agriculture is happening over the past 15 to 20 years. Scenic Hudson got its start doing farmland protection work, working with local farm families to help them conserve their farms um, uh, almost 20 years ago now. And when we first started, and I'll talk about this in greater detail, a lot of those farmers were looking back on their careers. They were looking at selling their development rights to Scenic Hudson, getting some capital from the sale of those development rights, and then maybe retiring to North Carolina or Florida. Um, a lot of, in a lot of those cases, they would be able to transition the farm to a new farm or another farmer in their same community. But so many of them were looking back on their careers. Today, there's this energy which is just palpable. I call it the food hive effect of sort of what's going on in the whole region, uh, in the Hudson Valley and in New York City where when we talk to farmers, and, and Emily and Evan are so emblematic, I think, in so many ways of that, it's all about the opportunity and the potential and the future. And it's not that it's all rosy and it's gonna be easy. We hear so many stories about how challenging it is financially in terms of a lifestyle for being a farmer. But the, um, the whole mindset is, has been changed. And I think the public's engagement with the idea of the importance of fresh local food what it means to them um, in so many different ways has changed. So what I'm gonna talk about is this relationship primarily of the Hudson Valley to New York City and vice versa, back and forth. This sort of partnership that increasingly has been growing around this concept of the food shed. And a lot of people, uh, I think, uh, over the years have become familiar with the, the concept of a watershed. Um, and certainly in the Hudson Valley and in New York City, there's a lot of recognition and familiarity with watersheds because New York City's been investing for 20 some odd years now, about 20 years, in protecting the lands that surround the source of its clean water that it has access to by buying and protecting farms and other forested lands and other properties that surround the reservoirs that sur supply New York City with water. Um, the idea of a food shed is not something that we or I invented and just created um, about this, this concept now, but it actually goes back to the 1920s. And there was an economist who worked for the Port Authority who wrote a book back in 1929 called How Great Cities Are Fed. And it was all about this relationship of the place where food is produced to the population that it is, it is supplying food to and what are the systems and the relationships that define how that food makes its way from the source to the, the people who, who need it and who, who are eating it. So what this map shows, just which is sort of interesting, is all, each green dot on that shows a farm that sells to New York City green markets. And green markets are the farm markets, say, at Union Square, and there are, I think, 70-some-odd uh, green markets that are operated in New York City. And, um, I show it because it shows that the greatest number and concentration of farms serving New York City green markets, and there are lots of other, of course, outlets for Hudson Valley food in the city beyond green markets, but the greatest number and concentration is located in the Hudson Valley. Not that farms from Long Island and Connecticut and New Jersey and, and whatnot aren't, aren't important, but this just in terms of showing that, that relationship. So when we talk about conserving farmland or protecting a farm, or working with a farm family to save their farm, you know, what does that mean? What Scenic Hudson does, and we work with a lot of other land conservation partners around the Hudson Valley, is we purchase the development rights to that farm from the farm family that owns it. And what that means is that what they're doing is they're entering into an agreement, and they get paid for that, because it's gonna reduce, it's gonna restrict what can happen on that property. Um, it's gonna mean that they can never subdivide it for a residential development. It means that they're basically committing this property in perpetuity to agricultural use, which means if across the region we wanna make sure over time there are still farms here to supply us with food, we need to make sure it's sort of the most fundamental thing is that the agricultural land is still in place. Those families are making a real commitment. They're getting paid for that. And then there's a, a restriction placed on the land called a conservation easement and that stays on the property in perpetuity. And the land conservation organization 
works with the farm family on an annual basis to make sure that those restrictions are being adhered to and that resources are being made available to that farmer. So that's, that's sort of how we go about doing that. Well, when we place those restrictions on the land with the farm family, it accomplishes a lot of other things. It protects water resources. And a lot of people think farming and protecting water are, are at odds with each other, but we're really lucky in the Hudson Valley. The average farm is about 135 acres in size. So we're not talking about these sort of Midwest conventional mega farms. The farm practices, the way people have to think about spending money to invest in farming their property is very different. And, and the quality of what happens on the land as a result um, is, is very different. And we did a study and we determined that more than half of the land that makes up the most important farmland in the Hudson Valley, not all of it's being farmed, a lot of it is wetlands and forested lands and steep slopes and other resources. More than half of it in the aggregate includes aquifers and water recharge areas. So when we work with farm families to conserve farms, we're also, as a result of that, long-term water quality in the Hudson Valley is being protected. Of course, at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of wildlife habitat that's being protected. The idea of a food print, I don't know if people are familiar with that term, but it has to do with food miles traveled and, and the carbon impacts of how we produce food and how we eat food. And, and at least conceptually, the idea of it's, it's a, you're having a much lower impact. You've got a much smaller food print if you're buying, sourcing, distributing food locally than if you're transporting food halfway across the country or, or across the world. And finally, just in the context of um, uh, people's familiarity and the idea that New York City might actually, as a stakeholder, become an investor in protecting <coughs> its food shed, the idea that it has in place this existing watershed program um, uh, is a tremendous um, advantage. So I think there's this, this is a particular moment in time right now. I started off by talking about how much has changed. And uh, some of this has been quantified. So there were two public policy documents done in the, um, within the last five years uh, down in New York City. And, and the estimate was that there was close to a billion dollars a year of unmet demand for fresh local food in New York City alone. And when we expand it to the region, it's, it's bigger. Regardless, you know, if that's exactly the right number or not, it's a big number and it means a lot to local farmers. If you know that there is this sort of uh, um, unlimited, what, what seems like unlimited demand for what you're producing, if you can produce it economically, if you can hold on to your land, you can manage the competition, then that's a pretty good thing. Your market is there. Um, increasingly, public schools, and I know there's an organization in Beacon that's working with uh, the schools here and in other parts of the Hudson Valley um, and, and all over the region um, increasingly are looking for school gardens and, and parents in schools want to make sure that their children have the opportunity when they go to the cafeteria to eat food that's of a higher quality and, and reflects some of the same values that having local and regional food uh, includes. There's also a lot of talk about, well, you know, it's really nice to protect these farms in the Hudson Valley. But what that's really about is you know, making sure that there's nice food on the table at the Gramercy Tavern restaurant in New York City, or that there's goat cheese available at the farmer's market for sort of people who can afford that. But in fact, um, the reach of fresh local food and regional food and the demand for it extends far beyond Gramercy Tavern and the person selling goat cheese at the farmer's market. Those are good too, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but but just to make the point that, that um, there are opportunities, and I'll talk in a minute about how food is it's, it's making its way into underserved and under-resourced communities. Um, and finally, there is this culinary culture which is exploding. It's hard to go to a nicer restaurant these days and not see items on the menu described by which farm they came from, who produced it, what town they came from, what region the food is from. That means something to people when they go to a restaurant. And that translates into dollars in the local economy and businesses that are more successful. So I was just talking about this, this notion that it's great to have this fresh local food, but is it really making its way to lots of people at different parts of the economic strata? So we have a, um, a graduate student who's working with us at Scenic Hudson right now Whose, whose job has been to identify the pathways by which 
regional food in the Hudson Valley is making its way into New York City communities. And to try to sort of answer this question, is it just about the fancy restaurants or in fact is there a lot more happening? The data is not complete and it's not by any means um, um, uh, fully accurate, but the picture, and there's copies of the report that he produced on the table called Local Food Pathways, but the picture that it's painting is actually that a lot of Hudson Valley food and an increasing amount of Hudson Valley food is making its way into communities of all stripes in New York City and in the Hudson Valley. So we have farmers in the Hudson Valley who have community supported agriculture, agriculture programs who have arrangements with um, uh, lower income neighborhoods in the city. We have urban farms and urban gardens which have arrangements with Hudson Valley farmers where they combine. We have the United Way working with nonprofit organizations in the city to make sure that local food, fresh healthy food can be sourced from nearby and brought in in an economical way. The green markets and other farm markets are able to take advantage of programs called Health Bucks and other programs that enable lower income people to increase the uh, buying uh, power of their dollars um, to be able to uh, afford food from local farm markets that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. So this is not just about the upper crust restaurants, although that, again, that's a good thing. I think it's really important to know that everyone des deserves to have access to fresh, healthy local food, and increasingly the mechanisms are being put in place to make sure that it's possible for them to have access. So um, where does this idea of protecting the farmland fit into um, what we think of as um, sort of a local food economy? And a, and a lot of our efforts in recent months have been focused on New York City itself. You know, New York City is the largest single stakeholder in its regional food shed. And so we think it's really important for people in the city and officials in the city to understand that relationship and hopefully to take steps to protect um, the farms in the Hudson Valley that are providing this food. Um, so New York City has local laws on the books that allow them to have a preference for local food when they're buying for city institutions. So they can pay uh, New York City um, schools or Department of Corrections or, or other public um, um, institutions in the city can pay up to 10% more than they would pay someone else if they are buying um, local or regional food. That's a great incentive. But the challenge has been, just like I talked before, farms up in the Hudson Valley are typically about 135 acres. If you're the New York City school system and you're trying to have a reliable, robust stream of whatever food, fruit or vegetable or whatever it is, New York City school system is the second largest food service institution in the country, second to the Defense Department of the United States government. So just think about the quantities of food that they need. So if you have a, thousands of farms in the Hudson Valley, but they're all about 100, you know, 135 acres <laughs> average, you gotta stitch together a lot of supply chains. You gotta st stitch together a lot of production facilities. You gotta stitch together a lot of transportation infrastructure to be able to get the food to these larger institutions in the city that um, are demanding it. That's part of the problem or the challenge going forward. Um, the other piece is the distribution infrastructure itself. So lots of people have heard about Hunts Point, the major food sort of wholesale market serving New York City where food comes in from all over the country, all over the world. Um, there's been a lot of effort in recent years and, and still to develop more efficient and effective food distribution infrastructure that's sized for and targeted at regional food so that farmers from the Hudson Valley and Connecticut and New Jersey, Long Island can get their food to the city in an efficient way and it can be distributed in the city in an efficient way um, uh, in the same context where you have these you know, massive amounts of food coming from all over the world to serve the major, the, the country's largest metropolitan area. Nobody is ever gonna say, and I'm certainly not gonna say that Hudson Valley farms can feed all of New York City and all of the Hudson Valley you know, year round with everything they need. But I think the point we wanna make is if it is important to the Hudson Valley and New York City to have access to fresh local food, we can't take that for granted. 
And what we need is the farms conserved, we need those procurement regulations, for example, that the city has to be implemented in an effective way. We need this distribution infrastructure. We need all those things working together. We like to show it in, in this way, sort of this idea of creating a more sustainable regional food system. So for many years, there was, there was sort of this tension. You were either about um, farm economic viability is what they would call it. So, so you know, if you're a farmer, you've got a lot of struggles with property taxes and you've got maybe a subdivision on your border next door and that's a problem and your local zoning officer is giving you a hard time because someone in the subdivision is complaining about the noise and um, you've got competition with apples from Washington State and the public policies here in New York maybe aren't making it easy enough for you to get your product to market and taxes, are, just all these different things. And so you were either about helping the farmer with those issues or you were a conservation group trying to lock up the land and make sure it was safe from development. But you didn't really understand the issues that farmers were dealing with every day. And I think the truth is we need all of these things. We need a secure land base so that the farm land is available to farmers at an affordable price so that farmers can get access. But we need the distribution infrastructure. We need good public policy. We need zoning laws that are going to protect farmers. We need competition, but we need healthy competition and not where local and regional farmers don't stand a chance. Oftentimes in the conversation, the idea of this land base, the, the pie piece slice at, at the bottom, wasn't part of the conversation at all. Increasingly, I think that this whole conversation has evolved quite a bit. And people in farming and in the conservation world increasingly understand that we do need all of these different pieces working at the same time, working together. We need all cylinders firing. So what, what Scenic Hudson and our partners, what have we been doing in recent years um, uh, to advance uh, this, this um, initiative to protect farmland in the Hudson Valley working with local farm families. Well, the projects we've been involved in, it's now close to 100 farms, over 13,000 acres, um, and those transactions of purchasing the development rights have put more than $40 million directly into local farm families' hands. And so those uh, farmers can use that money to retire debt, to buy new land, to lease new land, um, to help with family transitions, to increase their productive capacity of their farm, lots of different ways. There's no restrictions on those funds when they go to a farm family. Um, and the dollars um, have come from multiple sources, from the federal government through the Farm Bill, um, from New York State through its farmland protection program, private philanthropic dollars, Scenic Hudson's um, uh, dollars, Dutchess County has a program here, certain towns um, are investing themselves. The town of Red Hook, um, which is the first community we worked in in our farmland protection work, has passed a, um, several years ago a three and a half million dollar bond and a transfer fee on, on certain transfers of local real estate through something called the Community Preservation Act so that they themselves decided they wanted to invest in making sure that agriculture stayed as a robust part of their local economy. And the approach that we've taken where we started in Red Hook is something we call the critical mass approach to farmland protection. So as you can imagine, especially back in the sort of early 90s and mid 90s, the phone would ring all the time. It would be, can you help us save the farm across the street? It's about to be subdivided and turned into house lots. Or can you help us save the last farm stand in our town? It's you know, about to be lost. They're going to build a, you know, a such and such a convenience store there or something like that. And that would have been a valuable thing to do for those individual communities. But we were thinking about it longer term. Is that really the most strategic way to go about conserving farmland in this, in this region? So we did a feasibility study. And we looked at five communities where farming was still active and vital and where the community itself said, you know, we want it to stay that way. And we started talking with farm families in these different communities. And we landed in Red Hook in Northern Dutchess County is the first place we worked. We worked with seven farm families and together conserved 12% of the active farmland in Red Hook all at once. And the idea was by this creating this critical mass that you create this sort of defense or bulwark against 
um, development that's going to come in. So any individual farmer whose farm is protected has greater assurance that the farm next door is not going to be protected. And if you're someone who lends money to farmers, you have more confidence that your loan is going to be repaid because that local farm economy is in place. And if you sell equipment or seed or supplies to farmers, you feel more assured that that local farm economy is there because the farmers themselves have made this long-term commitment and because this capital is being plowed into the local agricultural community. So in Red Hook, like I said, they passed a bond, they passed a Community Transfer, uh, 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 Preservation Act, they passed in more recent years a new comprehensive plan and zoning that supports the idea of agriculture and farmers, you bet, were in there in the discussion and the negotiations to make sure that it was protective but not too restrictive and so that agriculture would be respected um, but agriculturists' rights wouldn't be um, uh, too tightly um, constrained. So as this critical mass approach to farmland protection was developing, um, the next year after we completed in Red Hook, we started a similar project in the town of Stuyvesant. And same thing, I think it was 1,000 acres conserved all at once in Stuyvesant. Today, 60% of the active farmland in Red Hook has been conserved and 45% of the active farmland in Stuyvesant has been conserved. We've also partnered in the town of Warwick in Orange County where they passed a $9.5 million bond and with other communities in the Hudson Valley. So the approach was sort of this town by town critical mass approach and at the same time, this public interest in fresh local food was just exploding. And increasingly people in New York City were, were uh, um, looking at the issue of fresh local food and saying, how is it that you know, we can take advantage of this and make sure that the public interest in the city and the unmet demand is being met? So I would begin to talk to people in the, in, in the city and in Albany and around the Hudson Valley and they would ask us these very simple questions. So how many farms are there in this food shed of yours? What's it gonna cost to protect all these farms? Where are they located? If we only have so much money at any given time, how are you gonna decide which farm to protect, which one is more important than another. And none of this really fundamental data existed at the time. So um, we secured a grant from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and created this document. Um, there are copies of it out there called the Food Shed Conservation Plan. And I think it's a first of its kind document in the country. It's a strategic conservation plan to protect the food shed of a major metropolitan area. And this focuses on 11 counties in the Hudson Valley and also Sullivan County is, is included in it. Um, so um, the idea with the plan was to identify where are those parcels of land that are, which parcels of land in the Hudson Valley are actually agricultural because you know, land comes in tax parcels um, and just driving down the road you don't know which parcel of land is or isn't a farm. And how would you prioritize them, one farm against another, if you were working with farm families around the region to conserve them? Um, and how would you, stepping back from this sort of critical mass perspective, identify are there areas of the region writ large where you might want to focus your attention? So the same way that we were working in Red Hook within the town, if you thought about the whole Hudson Valley, how would you go about that? So we did an analysis um, uh, using a computer, GIS, system where we identified every agricultural parcel and in order to prioritize, and, and then we did aerial photograph review to make sure that just because some, uh, you know, a box had been checked on a deed that this was a farm back in uh, 1994 that hadn't been developed into housing development or, or a shopping center or something else. Um, we did um, then take out all of the land that had already been conserved over the years. And this was interesting because we learned there was about 11% of the farmland had already been conserved, which meant that theoretically 89% of the farmland in the Hudson Valley was still at risk of development. Um, and then the idea was to, I, to try to identify regional priorities. So we asked the computer <coughs> to identify across the region where were the greatest concentrations of the highest priority farms and which towns had the greatest number of farms and where were the greatest concentrations of the best soils and the largest farms. Those were the two key factors we looked at were soils 
and farm size. Because if it's a strategic conservation plan, we want over time, if we're investing dollars, to conserve more farmland, more farms over any period of time than, than not. So this was sort of the map. And anybody who's sort of familiar with agriculture in the Hudson Valley, when they look at this map, they go, oh, I could have drawn that map for you. You didn't need to do all this analysis. Um, be because it, it sort of uh, gives you a sense of where the greatest concentrations of, of successful agriculture are in the Hudson Valley. But of course, behind this map are, is lots of data about uh, exactly which parcels of land in the Hudson Valley um, uh, make up these areas and looking at soil quality and size, a ranking number for each one. So that if, for example, New York State puts out a request for proposals for farmland projects, which they just did this past spring across New York State, twenty and a half million dollars was available. And farm families work with organizations like ours and other land trusts to negotiate a transaction based on appraisals and and um, to define how these different conservation easements on farms will work. You know, how, how would you decide if you were in New York State where to go? The data that's here helps a lot to help prioritize and think about that. So the Hudson Valley was very successful. We received uh, 5.1 million of the 20 million statewide um, to protect farms in the Hudson Valley. A group of land trusts from around the country working with farm families, put in those applications and are now working to conserve them. So, so how do we sort of make this, how do we operationalize this for the entire region and over time see a greater um, uh, sort of aggregation of conserved farmland that creates this bulwark, this defense, not just within a particular town, but across the entire region. So that the region and the city going forward can feel more secure that the farmland that's here and the farms are here will continue to be here. I like people, some people come up to me and they go, well, you know, you really don't have to worry about this because there is this huge demand that you were talking about for, for fresh local food. So as long as the demand is there, these farms are gonna be in business. Don't worry about it. You know, my response is not so fast. You know, if demand alone determine whether a farm parcel, state a farm parcel, the Bronx and Westchester would probably still have a lot more farms left in it. The Hudson Valley would have a lot more farms. We're continuing to lose farms. We lose farms because of a lot of reasons, but it includes real estate pressure, real estate dynamics, um, and, and lots of personal things that happen on farms as well. But if the farmland, through the active work of the farm family and a conservation group, hasn't been conserved, there's no assurance that that land won't make its way into the development stream at some point. So what we're doing now is working with lots of different stakeholders around the Hudson Valley and New York City, one, to educate them about this, that the data exists, that we have a plan, that it can be operationalized, that there are existing resources at the New York State level, and I mentioned it before, philanthropy and towns are, are willing to put their own money on the table. Um, and um, we, we want to make sure, though, that all of the stakeholders are participating. So New York City, which I said before is the largest single stakeholder, is not participating yet. We're working very hard in the city with organizations and leaders in the food and hunger and environmental and planning communities in the city and local officials there to see if we can't make that happen. And we want to make sure that the different programs, the state program and the federal program and the city and, and local programs all fit together well and are working well. Um, and then we want to establish metrics so that we'll know whether or not we've been successful. So if we're going to be asking public officials to invest public dollars in conserving farms, we want to know, just like Scenic Hudson did in Red Hook, that at the end of the day, we will have achieved something. So um, the, the number that I'm talking about with people now, just to help them understand it is, if we wanted to conserve a third of the highest priority farms as shown in the food shed report, it would cost about $240 million, say 250. Well, we're not gonna do that all at once, we're not gonna do it in one day. And to a lot of people, I see somebody's eyes just like lit up, it's like, wow, that's a lot of money, how are we gonna do that? But if you think about it over time, so let's say it's $25 million a year over 10 years, and we know we have the state program, and we know we have federal funding, and we know we have philanthropic dollars, and we know we have counties and towns that are investing, 
and if New York City got in the game, then all of a sudden you sort of piece these different funding sources together. It's not an unreasonable and unattainable, unattainable thing to try to achieve. And over 10 years, if we could conserve a third of the highest priority farms, and you think about the sort of snowball effect that that critical mass project occurred in Red Hook, you've really moved the needle in a meaningful way. So um, before I wrap up here and turn it over to Emily and her incredibly cute daughter, Ellie, um, five-month-old Ellie, who's going to steal the show here, um, I, I wanted to just let you know what you can do um, yourself to try to help help this initiative move forward. Right now, um, the state budget is being negotiated in Albany. And Governor Cuomo proposed, this is really historic, proposed $20 million out of the um, uh, bank settlement funds to be dedicated specifically to protecting, I knew she was going to do that, to protecting Hudson Valley farmland. And that's a first time ever. Um, and so um, uh, it's not a done deal at all, though. So that until it, the final budget is adopted and that $20 million is in the budget, we have no assurance that that's going to happen. So I would encourage you all to communicate with your local assembly people and state senators to let them know that this is really important for the Hudson Valley. It means a lot to our economy, to our public health, and to our local region and the character of where we live. There are um, some flyers on the table when you leave, which will tell you sort of how to go to the Scenic Hudson website, and then it'll get you to, to, um, to them. Two, eat local food. You know, make sure that unmet demand is there and continues to grow. And I'm sure a lot of you are here tonight because you already do that. And three, stay informed. We're going to be continuing to work at the state level and in New York City. Some people who are here also have a foot in the city or know people in the city and um, share information about this and, and with your friends and, and sort of gene us, jo gene us, join us um, in this effort. So thank you all so much for coming out. I don't know if we have a couple of minutes for, for questions, Anthony, or should we move on to Emily? Are there any, any questions, anybody? Yes. You know, I'm uh, not really familiar with Scenic Hudson and I, I really enjoy everything you have to say. And uh, I'm surprised, not being familiar, that the emphasis is on agriculture. When I think of the word scenic, it's more about tourism. That's my preconceived notion. Um, uh, like I said, uh, everything you had to say is wonderful. You know, the, we patronize the Beacon Farmers Market and, and, and love it. But I wonder, are there other partners or other facets of the, you know, the larger community that are partners as well in terms of uh, environmental organizations and conservation organizations and even horticultural uh, groups. Um, just and, curious. Yeah, thank you. It's a really great question. And of course, our name being Scenic Hudson, I think a lot of people immediately um, jump to, well, they're about protecting the views from the historic sites or <coughs> making sure that there aren't development projects along the river that are going to mar the views or creating opportunities for people to access the river, like here at Long Dock Park. Um, and we do all of those things. But, you know, 20% of the land base in the Hudson Valley, just about, I think it's 17 or 18%, is agricultural. And it's such an integral part of the economy, culture, and visual landscape of where we live and the ecology of where we live, that we made this determination 15 to 20 years ago that it was really important for us to participate in making sure that that part of our region remained healthy and, and vital. And so that's why we've decided to make that investment. There are a lot of other organizations that are involved. At the state level, um, the American Farmland Trust um, is, is very engaged. As I mentioned, in the Hudson Valley, there are land trusts throughout the Hudson Highlands Land Trust, the Orange County Land Trust, the Duchess Land Conservancy, the Columbia Land Conservancy. I'm not going to name them all, but we work with all of them, and each of them on a more local level um, work with farm families in their community and the general public in their community to strengthen these relationships and help to conserve farmland. Um, there are lots of other organizations, the Glenwood um, uh, Institute right, right nearby in, in Cold Spring is doing great work. There's the 
this Hudson Valley Farm Hub project in Ulster County, which is just getting off the ground, a, a project, the Local Economies Project. The economic uh, development community is increasingly involved in this because always tourism and agriculture in the Hudson Valley for the longest time have been the top two economic engines in the region. Um, IBM has been really important. There are lots of other industries, but in the region as a whole, agriculture and tourism are always, are always the top two. So there's a group called the Hudson Valley Agribusiness Development Corporation, was a non which is a nonprofit. The Empire State Development Corporation, the state, like I said, lots, lots of folks are focusing on different pieces of that pie that I showed before. Um, our, the piece of the pie that we're most focused on is the land. Is, is there anyone um, who's working on connecting people who want to farm with people who have? Um, my, my family has been on the same farm. I was the eighth generation in the same house. And, and the taxes are horrible. The property has not been farmed for a good number of years. Um, and the last thing that my sister and I want to do is see houses right. where we, they have not been. Right. And yet my, my father's almost 80 years old. He's not going to take a farm again. Right. And we have this land that the taxes are killing him on. Is there somebody who can partner right. people who want soil with people who have soil so that there can be some? You bet. And you know, one of the this is a classic story. I think the average age of a farmer in the Hudson Valley now, and it reflects what the case is nationally, is about 58 years old. So over the next 20 years, we're going to see this tremendous transition of farms and farmland if mechanisms aren't put in place to make it possible for new and young farmers to come in or for existing farms to expand. So there is a program called FarmLink, which the American Farmland Trust and a lot of local land trusts are involved in. Um, they're also in New York City, Grow NYC, which is the nonprofit organization that runs the green markets, has a um, young farmer development program and they're always, they have a, you know, a roster of new and young farmers who are looking for for farmland, so I would encourage you to go to those websites, and and they are actual listings and contacts. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. So we should move on. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you again for your attention. Thank you. 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 Of Plan B Farm Brewery. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit uh, about our mission and our philosophy behind what we do. Briefly, I'm going to touch on how beer is made, just for people who don't know, and then go over how we make beer, which is a little bit different, I think, than the standard. And then at the very end, I'm just going to go over this expansion project that's going on right now with our brewery for 2015. So our mission statement is at Plan B Farm Brewery. Um, we, pr we brew 100% New York State ingredient beers. We source all of our ingredients from the state of New York with many of our ingredients grown at our location, which is in Fishkill. Um, and our beers go directly from ground to glass within measurable feet of our origins. And the goal is to work with local businesses to produce a delicious product for the community that we serve. Our philosophy is um, today people talk about what is local, what is local when it means craft breweries. I think everybody knows where their local, um, local brewery is located, um, but those locations are where they make the beer, but it's not necessarily where the ingredients come from. Um, most people don't know that about their local breweries. So when we were trying to decide what we wanted to do with our brewery, we really had to focus in what local meant to us um, and kind of define that for ourselves. So we came up with that it's anything within this New York State. Um, and our goal is to over the next couple of years to reduce that radius of where our ingredients come from until we can say that I have personally pl planted and processed everything that goes into our beer. Um, so, and there's a couple of reasons that we decided to, to make Plan B what it is uh, today. We could have, we could have followed suit with what every, with a lot of what all the other breweries are doing, but um, you know, we decided that for us, it's it was a lifestyle preference, um, where the local vor movement of bringing things back to your local community, technology is great, and there's been this boom where you can have tomatoes in the middle of winter, where that never existed before until the technology of being able to bring foods from all over the world into one, you know, different places became available. 
Um, so the local vo movement is kind of like a um, an answer or a, a recall from that technology bubble that we now want to try to focus on foods, seasonality of foods, and ingredients that are that are located only in your community. Um, we also did this because I'm sure you guys have visited breweries and you've noticed that most breweries are kind of like in these industrial warehouses or industrial spaces and um, you know it's concrete and large um, large you know vats um, stainless steel vats but if you went to a winery you would expect to go into a farming area where you would see the grapes growing and you might the, the winery might be inside of a, a of an old barn well, we're trying to bring that back to the brewery because there is so much agriculture involved in making beer and we kind of want to our goal is to make that prevalent again to make people understand where their beer comes from and how that beer is produced and then finally we've chose to do to this form um, at, uh, of producing 100% New York City ingredients because as we are successful, we want the other people in our community to be successful. So we kind of want to, again, get back to that, um, what kind of lifestyle do we want? What kind of community do we want to build? And we're trying to be proactive in that way. So just briefly to go over how beer is made for people who don't, who, who don't know, there are four main ingredients that are used. There's water, barley, hops, and yeast. Um, all of these go through a process before you can actually start brewing with them. So water is usually filtered and the pH is changed. Grain is harvested and dried and it goes through another whole process that's very scientific called malting. Um, hops are harvested, dried, and usually pelletized. And yeast is usually cultivated and then sent to labs where they can isolate strands of yeast cultures so that you can get control over your flavor profiles. Most people don't understand or, or know that 75% of the taste in beer actually comes from the yeast and what the yeast does to the ingredients um, to make the alcohol and to make the flavor profiles. So um, the science behind what is happening is, um, like I said, barley goes through a malting process. And malting, really quickly, is just when you saturate the barley grain in water so that you can start the process of germination. Uh, that bulks up the enzymes uh, and the starches in it uh, so that you can get the optimal sugars that you're going to need in order to turn that later into alcohol in the fermentation stage. Um, so once you've got all your ingredients processed and you're ready to make beer, you start something called the mashing process. That's where you take grain and you, um, you, you saturate it in water again after it's gone through the malting process and it's been kiln and dried and all that stuff then you're going to put it back into water uh, you want the mash to be around 140 to 160 degrees so that you turn those starches those enzymes are going to turn the starches into sugars um, after the, the the mashing process you're going to transfer that liquid that you've saturated all that grain that like nice sugary juice that comes off of the grain you're going to transfer that into a boil kettle and that's where you're going to add your hops and any other flavoring agents like we add lemon verbena or lemongrass or lavender we have a whole bunch of local herbs that will add to the beer this is to kind of concentrate the flavor and to kill off any bad bacteria that you don't want in the fermentation stage then you're going to pull it out of the boiling tank um, and you're going to put it into your fermentation tanks and this is where those sugars, um, when they meet the yeast, the yeast is gonna eat those sugars from the barley and it's gonna convert it into alcohol and CO2. Once you're done fermenting, which takes about a week or so, you're gonna put that, that fermented liquid into bottles. You're gonna add a little more sugar. We actually add honey so that it reinvigorates any of the yeast that's still floating around in that beer. And since you've capped it, it's now going to seal the CO2 um, and sequester it into the liquid so that you now have carbonation, so we have the bubbles. So that's just a quick, quick, <laughs> quick, I threw a lot of information at you at a short period of time. There's not going to be a test. <laughs> For us, um, we decided this was a pr probably a decade in the making in our brains, but we needed to take these ideas and figure out if it was actually something that we could do. So in 2011, um, we actually, uh, or 2012, we had a friend that had a farm and at the time we were living in uh, Westchester. We came up to his farm and we decided to try to plant grains by ourselves. 
organically just to see what that takes. We set up one trellis and we started growing hops just to see what it takes. What does it look like? What does a year in that in that process kind of kind of take? Um, we it was a lot of work to do green by hand, and I think the most valuable thing that we had learned from that experience was you can't do it by hand. That it's something that requires equipment um, because it was just. We, we didn't even plant an entire acre of the winter barley, winter rye, and the winter wheat. And we took a small bushel of it home with us, and we sat in front of the television, and each night just pulled these grains off. And we realized that after a week, we had maybe five pounds. <laughs> you need 50 pounds in order to do one one-barrel brew, which is, what we current, which is our current system. Um, so just not possible to do it by hand. Um, so then we needed to find a plot of land to sort of start this project. Um, we found a one acre plot in Fishkill that had a house and this little sort of shed um, on the property. Uh, and what we did is we just transferred the lands landscape. We tilled the land, we put down 100 hop rhizomes, uh, we ended up building raised beds out of recycled wood that we found. This is what the inside of the shed looked like when we first came there and kind of we set up our equipment and tried to figure out what it was going to take. Um, and then come springtime, uh, we have you see our hops. Some of our hops are up here for ornamental purposes. Um, we had hops in the front. Every square inch of that property, we tried to grow something on it so that we could utilize all the space. Um, again, this is kind of our petri dish, kind of our test uh, plot. Um, and then this is what it kind of this is what it looks like now. So we had ripped out everything and kind of redid the inside of the the, the shed to kind of fit whatever the specs were that we needed. Um, so this is one of the trellises here on the right that we did. Uh, we did both traditional trellises that are kind of just, um, you know, from one end to one end with strings going up and down. Kind of looks a lot like the way you would grow uh, grapes. This was a TP version of that where you have one central part and then all the rhizomes kind of grow up like a vine from the bottom up. Um, these were our strawberry beds. You can see a little bit of lavender. Um, We've grown cilantro, basil, peppers, anything and everything. We tested it to see what it would taste like in a beer. Um, since we have, since we only brew with 100% New York City ingredients, um, you know, we don't have the luxury that other breweries have that they can just order whatever they want any time of the year. Um, if they want to make a pumpkin beer in July, they can make one. If they want to make super hoppy beers all long, all year long, they can do that. Um, for us, since we're relying only on whatever we can get from local farmers um, and what we can produce ourselves, you know, a lot of people will come up to us and be like, I really like hoppy beers. Um, what is the hoppiest thing you have? And it's like, well, we only really produce hoppy beers one time of the year, and that's when we harvest our hops at the end of fall. So um, we have to kind of be creative in what kind of styles we can get. Um, and then this is another picture of the hops. Uh, doing that uh, sort of the TP style um, uh, uh, of the of the hop growing, we were using commercial yeast at the beginning of our of our brewing, and we just bought it from White Labs, and it comes to us. And you can there's only really four main types of yeast that you that brewers work with, um, but we wanted to take on the challenge of also cultivating our own yeast strands. So um, yeast is a, a microflora naturally live all around us. They live in the atmosphere. And um, we decided that to really get a true taste of what the Hudson Valley tastes like, we wanted to cultivate that microflora and put that into our beer and ferment and um, carbonate with it. So uh, we, started out, we started out with the fruits of skins um, because the microflora in the yeast are attracted to sweetness. They like that sugar to eat. Um, so we kind of concentrated on the, the fruits of the skins of our fruits at first, but um, really what, you know, the, the bee and all that comes into play is we ended up getting some, at the beginning we had bee boxes and we were using the honey um, in that carbonation stage and then also to flavor some of our beers. But then we decided that there's so much microflora and bees travel in, in sort of like this limited three mile radius to collect pollen that 
why wouldn't we take the unpasteurized honey from our from our honeycomb and find out what microflora is living in there and that has that is what we now uh, ferment all of our beer with it's a really even though it's not isolated and sort of like this clean strand it's a wild ale that uh, is a living organism so um, over the life of our beers as you can see we wax top the top of them um, the beer gets to develop with that microflora as it's changing and developing in those beers. So when you drink it fresh, it's going to be different than when you age it for a year to see what that microflora wants to do and how it's multiplying and sort of changing the landscape. Um, the only thing we don't grow as of right now is our grain, um, that our barley. Uh, so there are lots of places that we actually get our grain from. Hadley, Massachusetts actually contracts with New York farm grain farmers, um, so there's no there's no rule about you know in our minds there's no rule about who's malting it as being sort of that um, New York uh, source because the the grains themselves are being grown here and Hadley Massachusetts is very close to the border of New York as well so it's it's actually closer than some of these other malt houses when it, when we're thinking about transportation and the environmental impacts of of transporting that grain. Um, we just put a down payment on a farm in Poughkeepsie uh, in January. Um, <laughs> so this is our plot of land right here. Um, it's almost 25 acres, and um, we are in the process of expanding our operations in hope of reducing that radius, like we said, to here, <laughs> to this 25 acre plot of land. We're going to do all of our grain production here, all of our hop production, and all of our additives, um, you know, fruits, vegetables, uh, herbs, anything that we're gonna add to the beer is going to hopefully eventually all come from this plot of land. Um, this will increase our farming potential uh, by purchasing this land and expanding. And we're gonna take on new brewing methods. So right now, um, we, we do age some of our be bear, uh, beers in barrels, um, but we do closed fermentation. We actually are commissioning um, a gentleman who is uh, doing cooperage in New York with New York Woods. So we are actually gonna have a New York, New York barrels and New York um, made vats, which we're going to do open fermentation um, so that more of that microflora can sort of be a part of this fermentation process. This is a picture of a cool ship down here. We're also going to add this. Um, it's it's sort of like an old style of brewing where you you pump the hot boiling you know liquid into this open vat so that it can kind of cool naturally instead of using. We have something called a plate chiller, which you can turn it from boiling hot into 68 degrees like that. Um, but instead, we're going to um, do this kind of open, for, uh, open cooling process again to increase that microflora um, to get a consistent, a consist more consistent taste from our microflora. And there is an old, old, old barn on the property. Um, somewhere between 1820 and 1850s is when this barn went up, and we are in the process of renovating it. Um, we are going to try to uh, keep it as original as possible. And this will eventually become our tap room and a place where you can tour. That part of that um, um, agro-tourism where people will come to the farm to understand and learn how beer is made, understand and learn what we're doing and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we're hoping that this, uh, this barn, which needs so much love, is going to be ready for our production phase by the fall of this year with a hope of taking probably another year before it's going to pass code and be ready for the general public to get in there. That'll give us time to start our farming, understand um, we're going, we have a one barrel system now, we're going to a 10 barrel system. Still very small on the grand scheme of brewer, breweries and how big brewing systems typically are, um, but we believe 10 barrel is appropriate to sustain, to be a self-sustaining um, to, to use everything that we can produce on that land. Any bigger, we'd need a bigger piece of land. So that's the end. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I did not bring any samples. I'm sorry. I do, we do, um, so we don't do any distribution of our bottles. We sell every single bottle by hand currently. Um, and we sell here in this building every Sunday from 10 to 3 at the farmer's market. <laughs> yes? You mentioned the organic farming practices. Mm -hmm. We are not organically certified, no. We, we just don't, um, we do no spray. So we don't spray and we use organic fertilizers. Um, usually we've used alpaca um, from our friend's farm, but we're not certified organic. We probably won't get certified organic, um, but we just, we will be organic. I mean, just for ourselves. Any other questions? Wow, that means I covered everything. Thank <laughs> you.